Yeah, hello. It's very really nice to uh, be talking to you after like, recording this project. It was really a lot of fun. Um, I will, first of all, like, maybe we can like introduce ourselves. Yes. Um, so, yeah, who are you? I'm Sofia Fosslund. I am a Swedish extracted Berlin-based scientist with an affinity for different witch cult concepts throughout history. This is basically what this project is about, right? Um, yes and no. Yeah. It's impossible to talk about this project properly without notifying its connection to an art exhibition which will happen in about a couple of months. Mm -hmm. So in a way this came about when I met this artist Mikafkin and mm -hmm. I basically saw how someone was painting the world as I see it and as I've always seen it. Yeah. And I was trying to stay around her and be inspired by her and perhaps inspired in turn. And then she asked me if she wanted, if I could help making some sort of auxiliary documentation for her upcoming exhibition. So I see. in a way this is intending to riff off of concepts that are touched centrally or peripherally mm -hmm. in that exhibition or as interpretations perhaps of some of those concepts and the broader societal or occult implications. I see, so this is how the project basically exactly. got started and exactly. got together. And um, and you knew each other from before and basically she knew that you can, uh, you can you, you have this um, chance or something? Well, we've known each other for maybe 10 months I think by I this time. And uh, uh, then the project was starting to be discussed and we finally came together and we found a very, very talented uh, actress and, uh, and screen operator to be able to help us with it. Okay, so um, basically like about the chants, right? Yeah. Um, like, did they exist, exist before the project or did they, were, were they, did you create them for the project? <laughs> These are all authentic chants from Mesopotamia. They're probably five or six thousand years old. Okay. With the one exception of the uh, Hermann Hesse Damien, Damien quote uh, about breaking the world's shell, which came to this project by way of an anime series called Revolution Golutena. Oh, I, I, I kind of thought you wrote this yeah. or something. <laughs> no, they're, they're, they're abbreviated. Yeah. Like the Maskim exorcism chant mm -hmm. is actually really, really long and repetitive. It's been used in, in pop culture before. There was a UK Satanist band called Coven, for example, that did a long song about it. Mm -hmm. The other ones, the most interesting one, I think, is the right of head overturning, which is essentially a prayer of how the goddess Inanna is enacting gender transition, sex transitions on worshippers. It describes these outcast men who feel like women, women who feel like men who come to the temple and are transformed into what they should I have see. been because they were actually transgender priesthoods of Inanna. Where, where was this? Um, In Sumeria. Sumeria, how 6, long ago? years ago. 6,000? Six, 6, yes. So this is actually cool because this is kind of like also the topic basically very of, much, of yeah. this whole project, right? So it's, it's a very like trans heavy topic. <laughs> trans heavy <laughs> topic, yeah, and project, yeah. And this is also what um, I liked about it so much. Also, like this whole um, going into like um, into uh, not graspable, how, how you say like abstractness, Abstract. you know, and going to the abstractness. Yeah. yeah. Um, so basically your process to approach this project was like to um, to search for the history of trans, like where trans has come up in history or something. So in her previous exhibition, me had a painting which made me cry so much when mm -hmm. I first saw it. It's a circuit board on top of which is a clay cuneiform mm -hmm. tablet. I believe of the chance to Venus or Inanne mm -hmm. uh, because this unites the ancient and the modern uh, this was very much the topic of her, I believe, 2016 or 2017 exhibition as well. Mm -hmm. But this new one is conspiracy theory heavy. And given the concept of conspiracy theory and the rise of regressive, often very transphobic alt-right politics in the US and elsewhere, yeah. it's impossible not to see a transphobia dimension and a conspiracy theory dimension to what is happening in the world, in the culture shifts that are happening in the world. And connecting these to the ancient, which is, again, what so much of me's art is about, mm -hmm. connecting something modern to the ancient, yeah. 
feels like a way of extending the narrative, connecting the past to the present and creating meaning, creating a narrative resonance uh, for stories that are woven in flesh and action today. It's the perfect like example basically to open eyes of people to say, look, this has happened before, yes. you know, and this is the circle, the That's cycle, amazing. you know. Yes, realizing that there existed both the Sumerian priestesses yep. at the gala in Rome and in Scythia were actually said to self-castrate and use estrogen extracted from horse urine to feminize themselves. Yep. That they're actually medically transitioning trans people as priesthoods and shamanhoods throughout history. This was in, in Rome, yes. or what? I never even heard about yes. that. But, um, you know, me, myself, I was always like very much in search for yeah trans people in history because I would always think like okay if if it's somewhere if I can find it in history this yeah. gives me like a hope oh, basically yes. to some degree this you know? is super important yeah I would say so and uh, it's actually so interesting now to um, discover new things that I didn't come to this conclusion yeah. I heard about this um, one Caesar yeah. once there was that um, he expressed the wish to be a woman and then he was even being Caesar he was like she she was like um executed right this and is exactly that priesthood it was said that this emperor indeed joined uh, the galai uh this this priesthood I have heard different accounts on the mm -hmm. historicity mm -hmm. of this. It could have been part of propaganda against her but this is a much nicer narrative. Yeah. <laughs> but it's indeed the same theological cult as <laughs> Heliogabalus. Yeah, and more I didn't know about this, but now I, I figure out. And also the other thing interesting about like the horse pee, you know? <laughs> I always had this still thought. being used actually for, for HRT all mm -hmm. in the 70s. The primer and pregnant Mary Urine was actually being used for these purposes. Really? Yeah, like yeah. they actually like... It's really easy thing. to extract it. You can use it historically. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I came up with this conclusion once because I was... Look, I had this theory in my head, right? Before transitioning, I was super afraid of tra to transition, and I thought, okay, well, what, what if, like, there was always this fear, right? What if I transition now, and then, like, five years later, because I had, like, this crazy thought in my head, and 2021 yeah. is gonna be, like, um, it's gonna be chaos, or yeah. it's gonna be a cycle that repeats itself. This is basically um, a little conspiracy theory that was bring in my head, and which basically is kind of touched, touched on by this, by this, Thing, right? This is super important. It brings me back to the theme of the exhibition as well, mm. because the conspiracy theories are always doomsday theories. They're saying that yeah. the world will come to an edge, there will be civil war, there will be a breakdown of society, and then either there will be a new society that is even more progressive, mm -hmm. or there will be a return to tribalism, to kings. I mean, this is exactly what the immense rights activist movements, the incels, uh, the Breitbart movement, all of these are in a sense arguing for a return to reactionary conservatism, mm -hmm, whether yeah. that occurs through civil war or not. Yeah. And I keep saying, and this is something me and I spoke about to some extent, if this happens, I'm gonna race horses. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's exactly my yeah. thought, it was like, well, okay. Yeah. Do you know about other examples in history of uh, trans, I mean, what I found out is that um, certainly it was, it was lesser examples, it was fewer examples, and this is for me like very much connected to just the society. If you, there must have been like so many people that just thought, well, fuck it. <laughs> it's like, they will fucking lynch me if I do this. I will not do this. I would just pretend, you know, all my life and probably this happened to a lot of people. Do you know about more examples though? Yes, I mean, you can see the era of Pakistan and I think other places in the far near Middle East as well. Even today, I think they're very ancient. And they, as well as the Thai Kathui, are essentially outlets where people can live gender non-conforming in a semi-accepted way. Historically, you have actual sort of subcases that are considered third genders or intergender in a lot of Polynesian societies. You have it in many of the American subcontinental native societies. And you might be interested actually in the Aztec variant, which I'm not really sure aware of, no. where sometimes if a family has too many sons, further sons will be raised and live as women. No, I heard about this is actually uh, nowadays also, right? Yeah. 
Oh, I was not aware. Of there it. was like some um, villages. There were some villages. Yeah, yeah, the villages. There, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Um, or like rail. In this yeah. case, it's not cool because it has to be like their own desire, right? But <laughs> anyway, there is this kind of culture and there's this kind of history yeah. about this kind of things, right? Often connected with shamanism, which is what I also want to tie into this idea of the witch or the shaman as boundary travelers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I heard also about this. Uh, Chevalier Dion. Oh yes, right? yes, 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 yes. Transman at the court of uh, was it a transman or transwoman? I don't even um, remember. That's the good question. <laughs> no, so, right. It was a trans woman. Yeah. yeah. And uh, she was a fighter first, yeah. and then she like faked her death, yeah. right? Oh yeah. yeah. I had always just thoughts about like people that fake their death. You know, mm -hmm. why would someone like? It's a really heavy act to yeah. fake your death, yeah. right? It's like. I thought Machiavelli to some degree, you know, I had like this yeah. thoughts like, hmm. Machiavelli fake this death or her? Yeah, yeah. No, um, yeah, Machiavelli um, was a war hero. Let's say he faked his death at 25 to have an advantage oh. over his, um, over his like um, enemies, right? Yeah. Because they wouldn't attack him anymore since I they see. think he's dead. So after the war was won, he mm -hmm. came back. But it, like, it's just this thought about like faking yeah. the death, which actually like passed through my mind to some degree, you know, also. Uh, anyway, this is going into crazy territory right now. Uh, let's go back to the project. Yes. Okay. Number one question, I think, which is a good one to start because it's a big topic in the project. It's like, what are the chemtrails? Yeah. So this, I don't know how old the modern conspiracy is. I know Alex Jones was covering it in his blog, but it's probably before. You do see the trails that come after airplanes in the sky. Mm -hmm. They form like a smoke trail. Contrail, I think, is the technical term. But at some point, at least in the last few decades, the idea came up that this is actually somehow releasing dangerous or somehow mind-controlling or altering chemicals onto the world for population, or controlling the population, purpose of population control. Mm -hmm. It is perhaps related to the idea that putting fluoride in drinking water mm -hmm. is somehow mind controlling and it's related to these other conspiracy theories. There are satellites that control people's thoughts, the MK Ultra project. So the thought is that some shady agency of the government or other conspiracy <clears throat> are trying to do something chemically to people. Now, what came up here when me mentioned chemtrails to me, and I was remembering all her various transition-related art, mm -hmm. uh, is the idea that the obvious chemical change happening in the world <coughs> is one of uh, gender bending and feminization. This is not entirely unfounded. We see mm -hmm. a rise in intersex conditions globally okay. in humans and in other animals. More animals and humans are born with ambiguous genitalia. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it may be plastic related, there may be rises in autism levels. This is all heavily debated, of course. And there's lots of different causes behind all of these, not least changing values in society. Uh, it's also not something I consider a bad thing, obviously. <laughs> uh, though I think mm -hmm. this is an area where actually I and me has a lot of different views. Yeah. But there is definitely both some actual evidence and a lot of speculation. Is the world becoming soft? Is masculinity on a very biological level being threatened? That the people of this generation are growing up with men more feminine, with women more masculine. Yeah. Uh, I even saw this crazy. But article. I mean, yeah. as, sorry, sorry yeah, to yes. like um, to yeah. interrupt you, but um, as you said, there are some like yeah. there's some um, things to back it up, right? Yeah. But at the same time, um, well, this is like this theory with the plastic, yeah. uh, which has like some traits exactly. of, of of estrogen, right? Yeah. Which I also heard about, but you know. Um, I always also thought that um, human race is evolving yes. and it's like there's all, all the time like obviously yeah. this um, aspect of um, of like evolution which is natural and then there's um, also like on the sp thinking about yeah. it on the spiritual level I yeah. always well I always considered us to go into a place of androgenity yes. over time you know naturally even like without our chemicals that we're putting everywhere and this is 
anyway, this is a big problem, but the other thing that I think, um, which is an inc um, interesting question when it comes to this is like, how much does it have to do with like little, um, like with chemicals yeah. that are spread it, that we spread and how much does it have to do with actually society? Um, like I said before, or like we said before, like people that like, for example, don't transition just because they're afraid. Yeah. For example, yeah. I see in Thailand yeah. a different culture yeah. and I wouldn't say that Thai people in general are, have like a higher tendency to be trans or something. Yeah. I just think that the people that are trans have a higher tendency to come out because of the different culture. I mean, I would have transitioned 20 years ago if society looked like it does now. I'm completely sure of that. And I'm completely sure that this is the main factor. The world has changed. The mimetic changes that have happened means that the same potential is expressed in different ways. But this is the progressive viewpoint and the conspiracy theory viewpoint is by far more fear driven and more aligned with that is <clears throat> in a way both mimetic poisoning and chemical poisoning if it's mm -hmm. not just exhaust from industries but the chemtrails from the planes actually are releasing uh, estrogen and other types of hormone replacement therapy for yeah. feminizing you know, the population yeah. that becomes a very elegant merger of the trans themes and ideas which as I mentioned go back very anciently in history mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the conspiracy theories and the fears of change so it's in a way this is a statement of the world such as it could be visible through the minds of a certain conspiracy mindset mm -hmm. today at the end of history than seen indirectly from an ancient lens. And this is very much connected to fears, yes. basically. Like it's changes. Yes. Like like you said, if you if you um, if you were brought up in the society yeah. how it is today, well that means that society is changing yeah. it, addressing it more and yeah. luckily it is, but like this is change and yeah. change always comes with fear. So I would say like this this kind of like conspiracy theories they really like address Fears, or, or come from fear, right? I mean, conspiracy theorists today, mm. they're not generally left-leaning. They mm. are people who are rooted in sort of a white supremacy racial perspective, in a patriarchal perspective, in a perspective where sort of a libertarian rugged individualism where each man has his gun and his farm and his wives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, in a way, that's... Look at the men's right movement where you have this idea that every man is entitled to sex and it's so bad that women are not giving them sex. And the, the interesting part is that in these movements, which keep talking about taking the red pill and seeing through the lies of feminism, so many of them, if you look in their subreddits or whatever, they seem so very likely to actually be deeply closeted trans women, <laughs> which is why the whole red pill blue pill you know, <laughs> gets amazing because it ties back to the matrix and may very yeah. well be a whole other, the person with that Sometimes. analogy. Sometimes, Sometimes you might assume, yeah. Yes. I mean, so much fear comes from a lot of resistance and yeah. so much resistance, like whatever you resist, yeah. it persists or yeah. it comes yeah. from a place, you know, I don't know. <laughs> like it's an interesting, uh, to see where we all go, you know, actually. And also, like, this is an uh, interesting part of the project because, yeah. like, um, this priestess that yeah. you, you play, yeah. like, she's from the future. So and that's the past. Yeah, in the past, but yeah. she basically is uh, omnipresent yeah. and has this answers already, right? Even though it's so abstract, like, she is basically giving the answers in an abstract way. Um, so, basically... I want to ask a little bit about the content mm -hmm. of like what uh, the priestess is talking about yeah. and um, yeah I just start with um, the god the god uh, Maduk and his yes. counterpart. So in the ancient creation myths of most cultures is the idea that there was unformed primal chaos being divided, the grey is divided into black and white, the cloud is divided into heaven and earth. Uh, Sumerian mythology has Tiamat the dragon uh, and she is being slain by Marduk who is making the world from her corpse. Marduk then becomes very much the archetypal uh, masculine god. He has his weapons of warfare, he splits something apart and creates, it's like carving out land for your farm. It's very much that frontier mentality. He's also a thunder god 
which means he's very likely the same as Zeus, for example. Mm -hmm. Maybe the same, weirdly enough, probably not of Thor, but of Odin. But mm -hmm. you have this, Odin, yes. yeah, in the European and Semitic religions, probably from some original primal past. But it's it becomes a very masculine uh, territory claiming yeah. god. And this is like the interesting thing we were talking about earlier that um, there's like a lot of similarities yeah. in different religions and different yeah. cultures that yeah. didn't uh, touch each other that much so yeah. they just came along together. Yeah, right? yeah. And I'm like, yeah, um, like for example Thor would more likely be like Hercules, right? Yeah. I would assume. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Um, so what about the counterpart of Maduk? That depends on who you mean it is. I mean, Tiamat is who Maduk is defeated. And Tiamat as the sort of uncreated but being divided, that's very much soil being tilled for a field. Mm -hmm. And in a way, this ties back to some culturally encoded images of masculinity and femininity mm -hmm. as the fertile femininity as being nature as opposed to artifice. Now, this is problematic from a number of different feminist standpoints, yeah. but it is also, I find, a useful perspective sometimes to take in transition. I feel that yeah. I'm letting myself embody also ideas of being natural yeah yeah um, and that is happens yeah. exactly and it's it's yeah. interesting that i um, listening to your playlist by the way which does have some yeah. references to this just so definitely you know. yeah. yeah i mean yeah. i was talking to an actress i was yeah. working with wonderful Leah love <laughs> just have to name drop um and we came to the conclusion cl conclusion like well very often like a trans woman like fantasizes about we were talking about which role we would like to play yeah. you know, and we, we said like yeah well very often like a trans woman fantasizing fantasizes to like yeah. step into the shoes of like the housewife <laughs> and shit like this you know so it's like yeah um there's like the divine masculine and the divine yeah. fem divine feminine but there's several divine feminine that's yeah of course yeah. and for everybody of yeah. course it represents yeah. it means something yeah. else but during transition it can be Nice, you know? Yeah, and this is where Inanna was interesting to me because that is another type of divine feminine. Mm -hmm. Because she is also, in a way, a creation of artifice. She's the goddess of love and war, uh, which means she is temperamental, egotistic, selfish, mm -hmm. but also fertile and creating fertility. Mm -hmm. And I found that for myself in order to construct and create my identity yeah. I needed something which is agentic mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. also undeniably feminine this is yeah. why I so strongly identify with Nana and the following goddesses that okay. resemble her yeah no I mean I definitely get it she also reminds me by the way a little bit of Gaia oh so, Gaia is more Tiamat ah I see okay so um, yeah I wanted to touch on the significance of n number seven. Ah, yes. <clears throat> this is significant in almost every religion, but in this case, in Babylonian Sumerian mythology, you have these seven demons that are in <clears throat> invoked as seven scourges. It's also matched by things like the seven known planets, so the different gods, Venus, Ishtar, Inanna is one of them. You have gates you pass through. However, What's more interesting is connecting this to, to a modern day setting. Mm -hmm. Because in Sumerian exorcism, you'd have, oh, my child is sick. The seven demons are in my child. Get the priest. Get the priest to exorcise the seven demons so my child is well again. Mm -hmm. Now, in 2017, I believe, there emerged this memo from the US Department of, uh, what it was from the US NHS, the National Health uh, NIH, National Institute of Health stating that in their applications for new research funding for healthcare research, there were certain terms that should not be used in the applications, which is a political decision on how science is funded in the mm. US that influences a lot of things. This has an effect of new policies from the Trump administration, which of course is heavily aligned to Marduk. <laughs> um, these words which we do list include things like science-based, evidence-based, fetus, referring to controversies around abortion, uh, transgender, privilege, vulnerable, etc., entitlement, meaning that there's a step to try to avoid yeah. research into power structures, what some people call grievance-based research, identity politics, which is a stupid word because no one who practices this calls it identity politics, <clears throat> meaning that there is an attempt to 
stop a certain type of academically driven political action by controlling research funding. I see. Uh, the idea that which came to me with the Sumerian aspects is that if Marduk and the powers of conventional boundary establishing masculinities fighting back as a backlash, that of course this is true Sumerian exorcism driving away the seven evil demons. Mm -hmm. And then if you look into the actual chant, the way these demons are described is by uniting of opposites. They are neither men nor women. Mm -hmm. They do not give birth to sons. Seven evil geniuses. That's very much the fear scenario of the evil gender-bending memes and chemtrail-driven chemical transformations of society towards androgyny. It's exactly what the alt-right and the Trump administration fears. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it makes sense to connect it. And, yeah... Definitely. And this is actually, sadly, not the only thing which I really have to address right now, which Trump has done yes. against trans women. And for yeah. me, uh, I will connect it to another yeah. point of, of your project in a second, but I will just name it. Yeah. It's like as soon as Trump entered yeah. the, um, the presidency, yeah. he instantly removed uh, a student protection law, Title nine, which, yes. which like um, protected trans students or they, it gave them one one of the things that did is gave them the right yeah. to go to the bathroom they yeah. they choose for yeah. themselves right so this is like um problematic like still every school obviously yeah. can choose like i'm yeah. not gonna force this kid yeah. to go to a room yeah. but the law is gone so the yeah. protection is gone this is problematic and this is like things that come like this and they just happen and nobody yeah. seems to be in a big fuss about it yeah. but since like schools can still like yeah, yeah i'm gonna let yeah. this but this is like um, small changes and they go into this direction and it's dangerous and it's uh, because of these fears of changes and everything. <laughs> then later he banned or tried to ban all transgenders from military. Yes. Then this seven words, right? It's, yeah. Oh my God. And... What is even more, this potentially rolling back actual legal, legal transitions on a federal level, though we still don't know if that's happening. Yeah. Yeah. And then like... Right now, also for like mid of November, he wanted to um, remove the right of every trans man or woman to like be the gender that they yeah. chose. Like they, they should like identify as the gender yeah. they were born yeah. with, right? And this is like for me, this was like whoa, boom! Like last, this was like he crossed the line. Like he crossed the line way before, but this is where I said like, okay, now there has to be. Like, the people have to stand up to this, yeah. right? But um, apparently, like, the people maybe are not misinformed or something, or they don't have have it clear in their minds how much he's, like, going against a specific group. And this yes. has happened before. And this is where we talk also about, like, circles that repeat itself, or how you say spirals, but... This is actually very interesting. I agree definitely on the urgency of these issues and that it reflects this war front we're referencing as well in the culture war where there is a backlash against the progressive changes that have happened in society. Uh, in part, this stems from complexities of the American system where a lot of things is actually not enshrined in law, but they use pre-educating court cases and interpretations. So you can have fairly large policy shifts happening without the legislature or rather without the uh, parliament being involved. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. What's definitely interesting in the concept of circles here, um, re references in Babylon in this, in this project now is in a way uh, also indirectly referencing the city of Berlin. To me at least these are the same, uh, East and East and West Babylon, which ties back to some various ideas and symbols that came up through its history. Mm -hmm. This is where we met as well in order to come up with this project. Berlin, Babylon, in the 1920s were an, was an extremely progressive queer place. Mm -hmm. And you had the world's first serious research into uh, sexual minorities, uh, into medical and social sex and gender transition. It was very, very progressive for its time, all of which ended with the Nazis. Yeah, which, so yeah. yeah you, you have a similar repeat there. Like the circle. Can, yeah. So and this we, was like, actually, by the way, the first time that... Trans gen, transsexualism yeah. was defined, right? Yes. By Magnus Hirschfeld. Exactly. Everything exactly. was destroyed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, that's the destruction of words, the destruction of seven words of research. Right. So um, <laughs> So this 
also connects to this topic in the project that you talked yeah. about the witches yeah. <laughs> let's talk about witches yeah. and about witch hunt yeah well burn the witch that was chanted uh, actually again during mm-hmm. the trump campaign um and you see this almost all the time in the modern age when yeah. female politicians are attempting to take up space of a very different reception tolerance to mistakes etc because there is a lot of this fear mostly in older generations you see it in a number of different contexts you also see it in the kind of hate that people receive online mm-hmm. including the practice of doxing or dogpiling on people's social media accounts where a lot of people are outspoken in a progressive feminist direction most of all but also LGBT protections and other types of intersectional justice projects you have a very strong vocal movement of angry, unempathetic, mostly young men who will pile on it and try to cause as much damage as yeah. possible. This is a witch hunt, if anything. And right now, I also yeah. feel like uh, a strong, strong like um, push in a direction to um, like ridiculize yeah. feminism, ridiculize like. Ah, it's it's a very strong movement actually and a lot of people are getting on this train so this is actually very interesting for me to see because i i was i was wondering like how can this happen and now we can analyze this and how is it happening and what about it is uh, based in what and then we can like try to like address this fears to some degree and, and like i don't know through Art is what I always hope is that I can like make people empathize, right? This is like my number one hope with art to make them feel, to make them empathize, right? So actually a big problem that I have uh, in this movement is like, yeah, the ridiculization and specifically it's like do things that I think are um, trouble, troubled for me. And it's like two terms, it's um, social justice warrior and political correctness. So yes. there's this anti-movement. Yeah. And I this think... This is the other topic where you and I and me have slightly different views. Right, I guess, yeah. Uh, but um, <laughs> I just have to like say it now because I have a platform. I agree with you. Which is like, um, okay, social just... And, and, and it's so easy to get behind this yeah. because I myself find... Um, find I, I see this like um, things that are going against it and I see myself sympathizing with some aspects of it. Because yeah. it's... Like, but anyway, just to make very clear, to be very clear about the terms we're going against, because it's, first of all, we're saying political correctness and social justice, right? How can this be a bad thing? A political correctness, right? How can we go against political correctness? How can we go against social justice? Just like, just like really, really basically think about what these terms actually should represent. Maybe they don't represent this for you, but what do they represent? Should we like call it something else eventually? Because this is problematic for me, you know, to go against political correctness and social justice, you know? So this is super interesting. Yeah. Um, Political correctness first, as a term, actually comes, I believe, from East Germany and is used ironically as the term that was used by the Stasi. Uh, Mm -hmm. I don't personally use it, but I don't think anyone uses it non-ironically, so it doesn't necessarily matter. I actually identify as a social justice witch. And this is important in the battle we're facing, because remember again what the witch is, the witch straddles boundaries, Mm -hmm. and uh, this is where I think we can survive the witch hunt. The witch is someone who remains a witch no matter what happens. You can burn her, you can put her at stake, you can deny her very identity and say she isn't what she says she is, all of that only makes us stronger because the witch draws strength from this opposition itself. The witch yeah. is someone who can survive throughout the most dark times of social change and social rollback. Um, I very much agree that these are not terms that should be demonized in the way that they are. Mm-hmm. And I think this is something that will turn around because this is memetic. Memetic change and memetic warfare, there will be a shift back at one point or another. But it's happening now. We should also remember, as we were also alluding to earlier in the project itself, things happening now have happened before. And what we're seeing is a antithesis to the synthesis of the previous step 
what's being stated now in the worst cases of the regressive movement is still more progressive than what would have been there a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago. So we're still mm -hmm. making progress, it's just you have continual new waves of backlash and change. Yeah. But the overall pattern is changing. We are breaking out of cycles, as you were implying, or rather we are shifting. A wheel is moving in cycles, and parts of the wheel are always going back and forward. That doesn't stop the vehicle as a whole from moving along a path. And even though um, there's like some disadvantages in like, for example, let's say social media yeah. as, for example, like, it's really programming us, yeah. people being addicted to it, it like um, maybe changing, deconstructing yeah. our social behavior. But anyway, I have a hope in social media because this like is it wasn't there before. You know, in the in the when the cycle was there before the, we didn't have, have this component. So I would I would and my hope is like that people take this as a weapon and like when there's an injustice Take this little smartphones you have, yeah. everybody has these things, oh, so right? We've seen this, we've seen this, this is happening. It's happening, yeah. So it's not possible to roll back. Some of these topics we could discuss at extreme length, and we should do that in the podcast, I guess. Let's do uh, that. Are there more things we should discuss now about the about immediate project? No, I, I think not. Questions so, there. about this project, yeah. um, it's running in the gallery in Los Angeles also, That's right? the plan. Mm -hmm. I don't fully know the details of this. This may or may not involve all interesting meetings with customs officials in the okay. USA. We'll see I see, but how is it called, the gallery? Uh, I believe this will be the gallery Nicodem. Just, just Nicodem? Yeah, the Nicodem gallery. Nicodem, okay. Yeah. So, um, I think the uh, opening is going to be in April. I see. Yeah. Huh? 20th of April. 20th oh. of April. <laughs> Interesting day. 20th of April. Okay, so... Um, uh, it will involve a number of... I haven't seen everything of it yet. Yeah. There's going to be a number of these very large paintings, a number of different artifacts, and then this, this commentary on, on, on the work, basically. I see. So... You can catch the, the project that we've been talking about. I mean... We went a little bit off topic because it's just so interesting oh, to talk. On that, we should continue on that. We should continue on that. Yes, well, definitely. Um, but basically, the project that sparked this whole conversation and that was referred to a lot also in this conversation is part of this art installation that you can catch in the um, gallery in LA in the Nicodem Gallery. Nicodem Gallery, gallery on Nicodem. Gallery, gallery Nicodem on twentieth of April. Um, yeah, a collaboration between like. Sophia. Well, this is, most of it is simply me, Kafkin, uh, but then yeah. we have and not worked on the capstone or the commentary movie. Let's just say, like, yes. Sophia, me, and me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, thanks for listening. If you're still here, my name is Christina Maka. Sophia Foster. Yeah, and bye bye.